The library has been the fortunate beneficiary of over 20,000 works of TED, including sketches, drawings, and writings. And we just recently learned of the new additions to the Dr. Seuss collection coming to the library, which are being publicly displayed for the first time this evening. To help us explore these themes, we've asked three incredible speakers to join us tonight. Um, it's my job to introduce them and then hand it over to Seth and get off the stage. So first, let me, or please join me in welcoming Mary Beebe. Mary has been the director of the Stewart Collection here at UC San Diego since its inception in 1981. As you likely know, the Stewart Collection is an ongoing program commissioning outdoor sculpture for the UC San Diego campus. Mary has also served as the director of the Portland Center for Visual Arts, has worked in the Portland Art Museum, the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, and the Fogg Art Museum at Harvard University. Please join me in welcoming Seth Lehrer. So Seth is a distinguished professor of literature at UC San Diego and the former Dean of Arts and Humanities. Prior to his time here, he taught at a few other okay places, Stanford, <laughs> Princeton, Cambridge, <laughs> Washington University of St. Louis, anywhere else, Seth? <laughs> okay. um, he's written some great books, Inventing English, A Portable History of the Language, uh, a book on your table, The Children's Literature, A Greeter's Guide from Aesop to Harry Potter, and most recently, Shakespeare's Lyric Stage. So welcome, Seth. And please join me in welcoming Rod Seidner. So Rob became executive director and CEO of the Minge International Museum in 2006. He's been at the Minge since 1993 after owning the Cable Gallery in Mission Hills. As executive director at the Minge, he has seen, overseen over 20 exhibitions. So thank you, Mary, Seth, and Rob for being our panel tonight. Uh, Seth, the floor is yours. Please lead us in a great conversation. Well, thank you. All right. Thank you, Eric. Thank you so much. Thank you all for coming. Uh, am I mic'd? Can you hear me? Yeah. Wonderful. First, let me say a few special words of thanks. Uh, I want to thank my co-panelists, Rob and Mary, for joining me here to talk with you about a truly unique opportunity, this collection of what we might call the unknown or the unseen Dr. Seuss. I'd like to acknowledge once again, of course, Eric for his remarkable leadership in the library, Linda Claussen as well in Special Collections for overseeing this special collection as well. And I would like to mention just formally that these materials that you'll see here are actually on loan from the Geisel Trust with J.P. Morgan as trustee. And I understand that J.P. Morgan has a table, and I think we should acknowledge <laughs> as well. So what I hope you've all had a chance to see uh, in the entryway downstairs, as well as in the small gallery area up here, are a collection of drawings, paintings, doodles, sketches, insights into the imagination of Ted Geisel. Many of these pictures may be familiar to you. The strange heads of his characters, the bizarre creatures that populate his zoo, and the at times disturbingly, how can I put it, awkward figures in landscapes that dwarf them. These are, how can I put it, the vocabulary of Dr. Seuss. And what we are looking at are the ways in which that vocabulary is expressed privately. Some of these are clearly sketches for larger works. Some of them are clearly doodles that Ted must have done while he was on the phone. And some of them are acrylic paintings. And I think that very few of us really recognize that Ted Geisel was an artist in many different media. So what we're going to try to do tonight from a variety of perspectives is talk about some of the ways in which this material stimulates 
our rethinking of the legacy of Dr. Seuss, and more pointedly, about what it means to look at this particular kind of art. That is, what does it mean to look not just at finished paintings or drawings, but at works in progress or works in practice. Now having said all of this, let me just preface my individual remarks by saying that I am a teacher and scholar of literature. I've been very involved in the history of children's literature, and I teach the history of children's literature here at UC San Diego. Uh, this course is fascinating for me because it is not just a course in the literature department, but it is a course that fulfills the major requirements for the program in education and in human development. And so I see many, many students who come from development and education, students who are intending to be K-12 teachers, students who are interested in child psychology and child development. And the question is, what is the place of the children's imagination in the expression of art and literature? And we do at least a week, and sometimes two, with Dr. Seuss. And what is fascinating to me is what the students think Dr. Seuss is. If you say Dr. Seuss to most of our undergraduates, they will say it's the copy of Oh, the Places You'll Go that they got when they graduated high school, <laughs> and how disappointed they are that they have not gone there. <laughs> and so one of the challenges we have today is, first of all, to make very clear that Ted Geisel and Dr. Seuss really is not the poster child for, as my undergraduates would say, neoliberal individualism. <laughs> that is, that Ted led a fascinating and complicated, and we know this, complicated politically and socially involved life. And everything he did has a rich resonance with the society he worked in. Secondly, it's very important to see how not everything in this collection is happy or funny. Some of it is in fact quite dark, and I think we should acknowledge that darkness. You may have noticed in the acrylic paintings in particular, the way in which you see small individuals almost lost in these enormous landscapes. And that may reflect something about the inner life of Ted Geisel, or it may say something about the public life that we have today. I would love to take my undergraduates here and show them those pictures to show them how they are not the only ones <laughs> who think of themselves as small people lost on a large campus. Now having said all of this, I'm here on the stage with two remarkable museum and curatorial professionals. Two people who have built collections and worked with collections in the community and come to this material and come to the legacy of Ted Geisel and Dr. Seuss with different kinds of perspectives than I might. And I'm going to ask Rob, since I noticed that he actually typed up some things to say, <laughs> if he'd like to open up. We've all had the opportunity, individually, to look at the aggregated bulk of this collection privately. And so each one of us is going to have a particular take on it. And each one of us is going to have a particular sensibility that we bring to the discussion. Rob, would you uh, like to share with us some of your impressions of this material? I'd, I'd love to. <laughs> Hi, everybody. It's great to be with you tonight. Uh, when I uh, came a couple of days ago to look at the collection, I had in mind a couple of questions. And one is, what surprises do I see here? And then I asked myself, these have all come from 
Audrey's home and from Ted's home. And I wonder if there are any particularly uh, personal things here or things that must have been personally very important. I'd love to comment a little bit on, mm -hmm. on each of those. Um, surprises. Um, I was wondering what images I might see that I'd never seen before in the books. And I've, I've loved the books, as we all have for a couple of generations. Um, but there are at least two pieces here that are completely new to me that I understand from Linda also have never been published before and yet seem to be totally complete artworks in themselves. Uh, the one is a little uh, maybe 8 by 14 uh, painting called Lion Stroll. Maybe some of you saw it. A group of four, a family of four lions walking across the savanna in Africa with a, under a a, a wonderful group of uh, red trees quite spreading out that reach off into the distance. And I thought, this is so complete in itself. And where has it been all this time? And why has it not been in something before? Is it a, a great idea that there wasn't a storyline for? Or, or what? And I don't have the answer to that. Uh, there's another one. Um, I've got to think about it now. Um, the tree with the flamingos. Oh, the, thank you very much. <laughs> you, you loved it too. Yeah. It's called uh, Nine Flamingos in a Tree. And again, complete in all wonderful color. Uh, nine flamingos with uh, all interwoven necks. Overwhelming a tree. I kept thinking of the parrots in the trees in Point Loma how they would overwhelm a tree. And here is a totally visual expression of how parrots or other birds can dominate a tree and a neighborhood, or at least a yard. And I found these just really wonderful uh, expressions that are, I'm, I'm thrilled that they're being seen at last. And I hope others will, I'm sure others will enjoy them as much as me. The other surprise is not as, as happy a one for me, and it was the acrylic paintings. And I was, there were only, what, 10 or 15 of them, I think. So I don't think we want to make too much out of this, but I was disappointed by the acrylic paintings. I find them uh, so different from the masterworks of Ted in crayon and pen and ink and pencil. Uh, they seem to be uh, not nearly so accomplished. And I wonder what, uh, you know, he wanted very much to try another medium out. And obviously didn't pursue it, but he, full paintings, that's, a, that's another kind of uh, investment of yourself in in acrylics, different from pencil and ink and so on. So that was another surprise for me that uh, I think is worth some discussion, but I don't think it uh, is worthy of a great deal because it's, it's, over, it's 14, 15 things over against thousands and thousands and thousands of masterworks. Okay. Those are initial ideas. That's wonderful. Thank uh, you. Mary, do you want to chime in? Sure. I think that um, the, the paintings are uh, a disappointment, but they're, they're very amateur, very unsure, un completely unlike his drawings, which are so sure and easy and swift. And, you know, really, he was an incredible draftsman, quick, obviously. But he himself said about the paintings that he did them in the night, just as sort of went in the middle of the night, and they look like that. They look amateurish, they look, you know, like somebody doesn't really care, I'm not gonna invest too much in this, I'm just gonna diddle around and see what happens. And that's, to me, what the paintings look like. And it's interesting that he, he was really an incredible draftsman and artist in that way, and it just didn't translate into the paintings and they're it's interesting to see them because they are you know little people doing little things in these vast landscapes but 
you know, some of the drawings are just heavenly. And one of my favorites is this little one. There's a woman in a sort of coffin-like thing and written down, and it's just a small pencil drawing. Maybe you saw it with a little note down at the bottom. I would love to come, but I'm almost dead. <laughs> you know, RSVPing for a party. And, you know, <laughs> You know, just sort of my, that's the kind of thing I respond to. I thought that was such a, and there's a picture of her in this, lying in this coffin, very perky, you know, hair sort of a flutter, and uh, it's over there somewhere, around here somewhere, but I love that. And I love the penguins, I mean the fil uh, flamingos in the tree, and the way he depicts trees, you know, they're, they're, it just sparks your imagination, um, and, and that's what, he does, and his use of words, you know, his play with words over and over the way he, there's one list that he made, apricots, peaches, pineapple, uh, something custard, something custard, squash. <laughs> you go, okay, <laughs> you know, squash obviously did not fit in with these other things, but it's just, you, he's just doodling and thinking out loud and making, you know, these, playing with these words. And I think that, you know, kids really respond to that, obviously. You know, everybody knows Sam I am and green eggs and ham, and everybody has stories about that. Um, and their mother dying some eggs so that they might see if they really would eat green eggs and ham, you know, or whatever. But uh, it's wonderful. It, just the way he engages you and your own imagination. And I had this other thought, which is that um, looking at these things, you know, he's making monsters really friendly. Mm -hmm. And Nikki de saint Fal, who did The Sun God, has done that too. Now there's not, it's pretty hard to compare the two of them on any other mm -hmm. level, but she loved doing drawings. She was really good at drawings. And her thing was her inner, inner demons came out as friendly things. And that's what she dealt with. And I don't know, you sort of wonder because of Ted and his dark side, mm -hmm. that if that was part of, you know, making these demons friendly and, and but in such a way that children just, well, everybody responds, not just children, but that's the miracle of it in a way to me that it's just mm -hmm. um, these delightful, wonderful uh, um, images that are so strange. <laughs> you know? Well, I think this is wonderful because it really raises some important questions. What does it mean to encounter the unexpected side of an artist? This is the same that we encounter when we, for example, will realize that Shakespeare was the author of brilliant plays and poems, yet there's a whole body of poetry and doggerel verse that is attributed to Shakespeare that we don't want to believe is Shakespearean in any sense. And I love the fact that you share with us that Ted did these acrylic paintings at night. And, and you know, I think of these, I'm not going to elevate them technically, but I do think that they're fascinating as a kind of dark dream mirror. Yeah. You know, that that is what we do at night. And what does it mean then, you know, for an artist to step out of a comfort zone and recognize, all right, maybe the work is not at the same level of technical facility, but there may be a psychological or artistic or an aesthetic facility to some of them as well. One of the things that I think both of you are also saying is this relationship between Ted's work and our modern sensibilities. That is, so many of the artists represented in the Stewart collection are of the generation or two younger than Ted Geisel, but are indelibly stamped with that kind of surreal or uh, imagination, that sense of uh, Ted as, I've always found this as a kind of, how can I put it, almost subversion, that's the word I want. You know, that the cat in the hat is subversive. And that for people of my generation, 
I believe very strongly that the American youth movement of the 60s and 70s was prepared by Dr. Seuss. You know, that the, the anarchy of the cat and the hat, the, you know, the verbal lunacy of on beyond zebra is so much a part of my generation's experience. And, you know, I have to say, betraying my own age, when I saw the acrylic paintings, the word that came to mind was trippy. And so you'll, you'll forgive me for imposing that, for imposing that on Ted. But I want, to, I want to get back to what Rob was saying about surprise. And what is there that is surprise? We talked a little bit about surprise as disappointment. What is there as surprise as thrill, as excitement here? <laughs> the other the, the other surprise that I uh, was seeing some personal things, mm -hmm. and I'm thinking of two particularly, and they're both out front. Uh, they are paintings in uh, colored inks uh, that were both in the master bathroom and oh, closet yes, yes. of Ted and uh, Audrey's home. And one is a uh, a man uh, in bare chested in green pajama bottoms, quite grizzled shaving with an electric razor. And, and the other is a woman seated at her dressing table with a handheld mirror saying, do I look as old as all that? Well, and it has think, a sort of bird-like oh, face. Right. You know, and I think how marvelous that either Ted and Audrey, or perhaps Audrey did it herself after Ted's passing, that these were very special to them as a maybe a reminder of their humanity amidst mm -hmm. the, the glitter and celebrity of their lives, that they were both reminding each other of their, of their celebrity uh, or of their, of their humanity. That's the only thing that I could see. I found it very delightful and honest and quite touching. Yeah. My favorite, uh, I think it's downstairs, is the strange stick figure that looks like of a kind of surrealist Miro or Yves Tanguy or even a Dali where the, the title is The Thunderbird in Retirement. And, and it's just this shell. And I think of this, you know, as, as I approach that particular time, <laughs> am I, you know, am I the Thunderbird in retirement? Or, but, but I think there is a poignancy. That's what I mean. There's always a humor, there's a wit, but there's always a poignancy or a tenderness sometimes to it. Yeah. Did you, what, what do you think, Mary? I, well, I think that's obviously true. The, um, the political cartoons are so direct and mm -hmm. irony and uh, poking fun at and having a good time with the political situation, which was very dire, as it might be today. Um, but he just has a good time with it. Yes. Or something else I was going to say, and now I can't think what it is. Well, the politics is very interesting because there's a lot of explicit political work, but there's a lot of work that is implicitly political. And that's kind of what I was getting at about subversion or about performance in some ways. Uh, what I find fascinating, I don't know if you've both noticed this, but, but Rob, as, as a curator of material objects, as someone who at the Minge specializes in the three-dimensional, did you notice all the gloves? Yes. What is that about? <laughs> what do you think that's about? I have no idea. <laughs> and I, well, would, I would love to hear you. We're, I truly, we're among friends, I, yeah. and this will be recorded for posterity. So speculate. <laughs> it, the gloves did not pull my attention, honestly. They did not? But I agree with you. There are a load, everywhere. A load of them there. Did you notice these things? He didn't like to draw hands. Okay. <laughs> he didn't like to draw hands, so? He left them out. He I left them out. I don't know. He put gloves on. I don't know. <laughs> I think, yeah. I think that gloves, I think hats. Yeah, right? hats. He are, yeah. loves hats. He They're loves everywhere. hats. What is there about hats? Are uh, there hats uh, costume. at Minge? Costume. Oh, sure. What is the we've hat? Done, we've done a hat show. <laughs> We've done that. Uh, it's, a, it's a way of taking on another personality. Sure, along okay. With mm -hmm. Masks along with other textiles, costume, apparel. Right. I think it's, it's all performance. Mm -hmm. 
I think it could be all of those things. There is a sense in which I think Ted was very influenced. I mean, he was born in, I think, 1904. So he must have been very influenced by what we might think of as pre-media performance. Music hall, minstrel show, vaudeville. There's a powerfully stage performance. stage performance. He was also in play. You can see the influence of Dolly, obviously, mm -hmm. the surrealism. But at some of the time, I sort of thought I noticed the influence of Japanese prints. Okay. Just um, not in all of them. By what by in particular? Image. What aesthetic did you find? What did you, you did you find in those? Well, again, just the clarity mm -hmm. and the um, and the graphic sense. Yes. And the um, there was one that just the way he uses lines mm -hmm. um, that to present rain or okay. you know other mountains or mm -hmm. other things. There was one of a particular uh, creature. Uh, that made me think that. Mm -hmm. I can't remember which one it was now, but uh, it is it is interesting to see him pulling in all these uh, different influences. All into the traditions, the, yeah, yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. they were around at the time. Yes. And he would have known about them. Absolutely. And uh, been interested, and I think it goes back in a way to his pushing himself at night. Mm -hmm into a different medium that he didn't really, wasn't really comfortable with. It's clear in the paintings mm -hmm. that they're not easy for him and that he's sort of searching for a way to do something out of his range, That's which right. I think is mm -hmm. an art, always an artist. That's um, what artists do. Yeah, is to push themselves into different. And when they're not successful, they don't really, you know, they're just trying. Mm -hmm. They're not, they're not, they don't take it up as a, a thing. Yes, it's well, a nighttime. Yeah, I, I would like to really emphasize that. Though, something I noticed in how many doodles there were, yeah. how many tryouts there were yes. in what he did. Mm -hmm. And I found that, uh, to me, as a rank amateur, I found it very encouraging that a man of, <laughs> <laughs> that a man of such mastery, yes. whom we all recognize as as without peer mm -hmm. in, in what he has done, that for even him, it was often 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. Yeah. <laughs> he tried again and again and again, both with visual expressions and trying out words, again and again and again. And there's many, a lot of that in what is coming uh, to the library, both in what we're seeing here and in what is also in the 275 works that are promised, I understand. Right. The, I had a chance to look at all of those in thumbnails, and it's, it's really fascinating to see the artist at work. And with that in mind, I want to draw attention to one other uh, drawing that's there, and it's the uh, self-portrait of the artist worrying about <laughs> oh, his yeah. next book. <laughs> and it's just mm -hmm. such a... a <laughs> So encouraging to anybody who's ever sat in front of a blank sheet of paper and been wondering about wow. where's the idea going to be come from. Yeah. It's a, yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. No, it reminded me of many years ago, I had a colleague who was extremely self-important. We don't know people like that, but I remember he waltzed into the mailroom when I was there and he said, well, I've just finished another book. And I said, reading or writing? And he got so upset. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's always wonderful to have a new audience, you know, <laughs> who hasn't heard these stories before. So, but that picture reminds me of that as just sort of the, the sort of the self-consciousness of this, of this worry, like where is it going to come from? And then the, the exultation that I've just finished it and the remarkable quality of it. We started a little late tonight, and I think we don't want to keep people too late, but we did want to have an opportunity for some question and answer. And I think we have a gentleman here with a question. So uh, back in the dark ages, and I'm referring to my high school days, mm -hmm. and early college days, 
professors and teachers would ask their students, uh, it would give out assignments and they would say, compare and contrast. Yes. Mm -hmm. Some of you are nodding your heads. You mm -hmm. seem to remember that. Um, I would like any of the three of you, or all three of you, to compare and contrast Theodore Geisel and Morris Sendak. Theodore, oh, Geisel and Sendak, compare and contrast the two iconic children's illustrators and writers of the mid 20th century. It's a wonderful question. Well, I think Mary is a good start because <laughs> you talked about the monsters. How would you compare and contrast Ted's monsters with where the wild things are? Well, I think what the wild things are are much scarier. Well, they're much more Jewish looking. <laughs> I can say that. You know that Sendak modeled them on his relatives. I don't know that. Yes, that's what he said. <laughs> Whereas I doubt that Ted Geisel modeled his characters on his relatives. That's probably true. Maybe he modeled some of them on his friends in La, in La Jolla. You think so? <laughs> but you think Ted's know. are less scary? Well, they're friendlier in a way. I mean, I oh, think Oh, I think Sendak the wild guys are phenomenally. Well, that's, that's my yeah, problem. They, yeah, they yeah. are. They're, I don't know. They're sharper. Okay. For one thing, they're much sharper. Yes. And uh, thornier. Mm hmm. And uh, uh, the play of words isn't yes. there. Yes. Yes. So I'm not sure what else. Rob, I have to compare think about and contrast. This longer. <laughs> the guys who think they're much more benign. You think so? And yes. I really do. And friendlier, more. Uh, accessible. Mm -hmm. uh, the others are uh, fearsome and engaging in that way, yes. you know, attractive in that way, mm -hmm. but in a much more of an edge to them. But, you know, in a way, I think that, you know, look, Geisel and Sendak are both immigrants in a sense, because Sendak is a European who comes to America, and Geisel is an East Coaster who comes to California. <laughs> and, <laughs> Could you tell I'm from the East Coast? <laughs> and as we know, you know, you walk around La Jolla and you see these bizarre trees and this strange succulent vegetation and it's Susian. So I think that both of them in some way are both dealing with what it means to grow up in one place and show up in another place. Where were you in? Uh, in high school. You talked about your, your life. Yes. Where were you physically? Right here in San Diego. Really? Well, that says a lot for the San Diego public school system. Yes. I was actually born in, in Poland. And, but you, so you understand the sensibility. You see what I'm getting at? I mean, the, seriously, of how that sense of displacement and immigration generates a vivid imagination in both. Do we have another question? Um, when I went to New York as a young person yes. and I got a job at Random House, uh -huh. I was a, given a desk right outside of Ted Geisel's editor. And so every time they got, he got a postcard from, from Ted, and then I come to La Jolla and magically, a few years later, my friend is Jean Jones, and then we became very close friends with Ted. So mm -hmm. I had a chance to spend a lot of time, because I'm a literary agent, yes. talking about his motivation and what it was mm -hmm. about his books. He said he never wrote the books for children. They were for adults. Mm -hmm. And the fact that they became children's books, you know, bestsellers, right. was an enormous surprise because this oh. was great because it was getting a vaster yes. audience than just the adults. So this is a man who worked six days a week, unfailingly, and then when I, when I hear about the work you're talking about, mm -hmm. it had to be a release. I, I would see what think you're it's a release. You mean the now. acrylic paintings acrylic at night? Paint. Right, because here mm -hmm. he's trying to please a publisher who is mm -hmm. making demands sure. on him. And so 
every once in a while you gotta let go, right? Yeah, absolutely. Well put. Thank you. Are there other questions? Do, uh, do we have another? Down there? Can we? I worked in economic development for many years, and we once organized an entire program uh, around an editorial cartoon that Ted Geisel drew after some, and I can't even remember what referendum it might have been, but his question was, onward to where? <laughs> and my question to you is, do you think he would have asked that question no matter where he was? He happened to be in San Diego and living in La Jolla, but it was so, at that time, prescient about the questions we were trying to answer, and do you think that he would have brought that to any community he was living in? I wouldn't be surprised if he, if he did bring that to any community. It's interesting, because a lot of artists work, you know, 24 hours or like, you know, six days a week and maybe off on Sunday, because they're pursuing something, you know, they're pursuing and, and they need to keep going, and they need to keep pushing themselves. But I think, Ted, I mean, where are we going is a, an ex existential question of all time, right? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yeah, I think, you know, he was uh, questioning, you know, all the time. Where do you think he was going, He Bob? He said that he never began a book with the idea of a moral in mind that he wanted to uh, achieve by the end. And yet he said, every story has a moral to it. I, I think he was constantly trying to teach and trying to encourage and, and um, inspire people to think about very basic life questions. I think that's, that's the attraction of these books for so many of us even as adults, that there, there is something that's deeply encouraging and inspiring about them. I think that's true, and I think that's why it teaches so well. And I think that bringing Seuss into the college classroom, a story like the Sneetches and the Starbellied Sneetches, there's this wonderful episode in it in which a man comes to Sneetchville with a machine, and if they pay him money, he will send them through the machine, and those who don't have stars on them will get stars. And I was teaching this to my undergraduates, and one of them said, that's just like college. <laughs> you pay somebody money, and they give you a star. <laughs> and I think that that's part of the... Sorry? That's I think that part of the moral of this is that by continuing to look at both the familiar and the unfamiliar, the good and maybe the disappointing, part of what we're going to recognize is that in the end it doesn't matter whether or not we have a star. Really all that matters is the way in which we're able to look at the world and as you say, to go, to have the courage to go someplace we don't know. And I can thank my panelists here because we've gone to places we didn't think we would go tonight. <laughs> and I'm sure that all of you have felt the same throughout your lives. I hope you do have a chance to see at least some of the material on exhibit. And I'm looking forward to the time when this material ideally comes to UCSD permanently. But all I will say is this, that on your, on your tables there are books, and every book is a portal to a place you haven't been. And that's why I became a literature teacher. So I want to thank you all, thank our panelists.